Fresh off a congressional delegation, I believe, to, uh, I want to say Vietnam, it's uh, Representative Brad Winstrup to talk about this morning on 700 WOW. Brad, how are you? I'm doing fine. How are you, Scott? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. well let's start with this. Uh, let's start with the, uh, you're fresh back from a, a foreign trip, correct? I am. Um, actually, you know, I was in Kiev. Uh, oh, Kiev. Right okay. Christmas last year. No, <laughs> no. Right before Christmas last year. Recently, I just went to uh, Taiwan with a with a stop in Vietnam mm -hmm. as well. But you know, you were ta we're talking about the situation in Ukraine right now. You know, it, it just it, it floors me as a human being that uh, Putin has no side of him that can't take a look at the world and say, "Why don't people like me?" <laughs> you know, you have an organization like NATO, 36 countries all around him that exist in unification in a unified manner because of him and his and his efforts. And, uh, you know, what we see, though, you, you, the scary part, I guess, is what's the response going to be as he gets more desperate? You know, he thought he was going to waltz right into Ukraine and take it over and have no resistance and everything was going to be fine. He had high hopes for his military, which has proven to fail on many fronts. And so the response has um, kind of shocked him. And what's his response right now is to bomb the capital <clears throat> and to start to take things out. What, what does he want Ukraine to be left to look like? I don't understand what he hopes to gain uh, by all this, because this is a sovereign nation, which Russia had agreed to, uh, that he just decided to attack and has not attacked Russia in any way, shape, or form. And he's trying to act like he's been provoked, which is not the case. And what we're seeing right now, you know, war age males, if you will, are leaving. They're leaving Russia. They're going to Armenia, Belarus, Georgia, Kazakhstan. I've even heard some going to Alaska, South Korea. You've got some Russians that are starting to take to the streets and protest, even though they'll uh, shoot that down, if you will. Uh, We've seen a sloppy Russian military, but what we have seen is the Ukrainians fighting very well with high morale, with a sense of purpose, because they're freedom fighters. And they remember what it was like to be under Russian rule or Soviet rule, and they don't want any part of that again. So they are, they are driven, and they are the ones doing the fight. And as I said, I was in Kiev right before Christmas, and they were decorated for Christmas, and they were out shopping, and everything was normal. I stayed at a Marriott, but they knew it was coming, and they were trying to get as prepared as they possibly could. I, I do find it interesting and, and possibly not just coincidence that they moved and took Crimea under the Obama-Biden administration, they did not take any further action under the Trump administration. And now under the Biden administration, they have moved in to try and take over the whole country. I don't think it's coincidental either, Brad Winstrup. Um, and the thing with Putin is, is what, what's his end game? What's he doing in, in convincing the rest of the world? The rest of the world is against him. I don't think he cares about that. It's not convincing us. It's, it's convincing his minions, and that would be people in Russia, which if you're older, you probably are more in line with the state media, the state politics of it. If you're younger, you're going to getting for your information from outside sources, which is why we're seeing so many people of age uh, wind up leaving the country. Yeah, they don't want to be conscripted into the military and die in Ukraine fighting their brothers. But at the same time, if you look at the demographics of it, it's it's largely for older people who are buying all this nonsense. Yeah, and you're right about the younger people, because really, after the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, a generation of Russians started to get to see the rest of the world where they really didn't get to before. And so they're not necessarily buying into what he's selling in, in the same way that the older generation would. And so it, it, it is interesting. And, you know, our goal now is to stop Russia in their tracks, because I think that they felt they could go into Ukraine. That would be easy. And then they'll just go to one of the next countries that's part of the former Soviet Union. I mean, right now, even Belarus, with their leadership, is, is in bed with Russia. And I think he thought he could just uh, keep going. But what he's done as a result is united the, the European Union, even Eastern Europe, and united NATO in ways that they have not been united before. And now you see them from the economic standpoint and from the energy dependence standpoint trying to pull away from Russia as, as much as we can. Unfortunately, in the United States, uh, this administration has gone from making the United States energy independent to energy dependent, and that's not helping us help our neighbors.
Well, that's critical. You look at Germany and Europe and how long and cold the winter is going to be there. That That's exactly 100 percent right there, which would explain the waning popularity of the president here uh, stateside because of the conflicting messages and policies. And not only that, the fact that... Um, you know, we don't seem that engaged with what's going on over there. When I hear that um, we're at DEFCON 1, when the president says, yeah, we're, we're you know on high alert, basically, um, people hear that as a threat to the mainland, as the homeland. Uh, do, you, do you perceive that as being an issue or is Biden way overstepping his, his analysis of that? Well, I wouldn't want to be working at the White House at this time uh, because there's so many things that the, the president has said that the White House has to, has to walk back. Um, I, I hope that it's not something we concern with the homeland. Look, Ukraine has been very um, patient, if you will, uh, in their fight because all they're trying to do is drive Russia out of Ukraine. And they have not gone into Russia. And actually, I think Putin would like that because then he would say he's been provoked. Right. Um, so, so they're fighting very smartly, I would say, and I think continue to have the the rest of the world, especially the free world uh, behind them. So as far as the United States is concerned, I don't think that's an issue at this time. I don't think I don't think Putin is that stupid. Um, I'm not sure why the president would say that, but uh, I think that uh, we should continue to support them. But we have to support Ukraine smartly. That's what I think is on the minds of a lot of Americans. Yeah, yeah that's fine. We want to support them. But let's make sure we're doing with, with all the other countries helping as well. And let's make sure that what we are doing, what kind of aid we're sending, is having a positive effect toward a towards the end that we want to seek, which is a free and sovereign Ukraine. How far can we go, Representative Brad Winstrip, on supporting Ukraine? Um, because Putin sees any uh, anything we do for them as us provoking them into war. So outside of, I don't know, helping them shoot down uh, Russian assets or going after where they're launching from, which would be in Russian territory, which would be an act of war. Outside of that, what can we do? What else can we do? Because uh, I, I think that um, the, the, the Ukrainians said that they have maybe about 10 percent of what they need to actually fight this war and win. Well, humanitarian aid is one thing for sure that it would be hard for him to say that this is a, an act of provocation. And also, uh, one of the things uh, that I uh, have been concerned about is how are they being addressed when they are wounded? Uh, what you know, as someone who has served in war as a as a combat surgeon, and and actually somebody who served at Abu Ghraib prison where we took care of the enemy. I mean, our job was to win over the hearts and minds and take care of people. Uh, we can be doing some of this in some of the surrounding nations uh, to provide medical care and humanitarian aid for people that are fleeing or temporarily fleeing before they go back to get into the fight. So those are types of things that I think we can do and be very helpful in addition to what we have been doing, which is uh, providing the right type of military equipment that they can use to win the fight, but also sharing of intelligence. I think it's important that we do... A, a good job of letting the Ukrainian military understand what we understand as we're able to watch and monitor Russia and understand their strengths and weaknesses. Yeah. Uh, Representative Brad Winstrup on the show this morning on 700 WLW. But I know you said you went to uh, Taiwan through Vietnam and the like. What was that about? Well, um, you know, there's a lot of concern in the region with the aggressive nature of of China, not only economically, that would be one thing, but what they have been doing militarily and how they're trying to take over the region and be the hegemon in the region for sure, control all the waterways and some of the surrounding nations uh, feel that their their territorial rights are being invaded and in being intimidated. So uh, Taiwan, of course, is on everyone's mind. And we just finished talking about Ukraine there. Uh, it's that, that's a message to China, I think, that they want to consider an invasion of Taiwan in, in many ways, similar to what they did against the agreement with, with Hong Kong, went in and basically took that over and stripped it from its autonomy, which was part of the deal for like supposed to be existing for 50 years. Mm -hmm. And that was done with the hopes that China was going to become more of a democracy and more Western style, but they're you know, they want to continue to have their domain and power. So Taiwan is worried about that. They really functioned autonomously. China 
like to say, well, we're all one China. Okay, well, let them continue to function at- at- autonomously and different from the rest of the mainland. And that's worked very well. It's worked very well for Taiwan, and they're like the Ukrainians. Uh, they'll fight for freedom, and they do not want China coming in and taking over all their industry and their free enterprise and and this type of lifestyle that they have. So I was there to try and strengthen the bonds that we have with Taiwan and talk about the security and stability of the region in South China Sea, the importance of trade between uh, Taiwan and the United States and uh, protect our nation Mm -hmm. and as well as their nation from an adversary like China and also to send a message to China uh, that we really don't like what you're doing and what you're trying to do. And it's, it's aggressive and it's disruptive and it's not, not peaceful in any way. You don't see China trying to work some things out diplomatically with, with Hong Kong and, and sorry, with um, Taiwan. And uh, they want to be the only superpower in the world, not yeah. just a superpower in the world. They want to be the only superpower in the world. And so they're posturing militarily, unfortunately, not diplomatically. And, and so that was the purpose of the visit, is to continue to uh, strengthen our relationship with Taiwan and hopefully allow them to have many, many years, decades, centuries of freedom. Well, I'm looking at uh, uh, Fox Business is on one of the monitors this morning, and I see uh, you and Representative Waltz and others standing there with the Taiwanese president last week and talking about these things. So it checks out, Brad. I didn't have to do a background check to make sure you weren't lying to me. I actually see a picture of you. You, you have an <laughs> alibi. I got you. You have an alibi. You, that's you in a picture on the left uh, in the office of the president of Taiwan. So it check, the story checks out this time, Brad. Yeah, well, you know, you don't know if it's Photoshop or not, really, though, do you? I mean, um, but... It, it, but it's, it's critical. You know, no, and all seriousness, this is a critical thing. I mean, Speaker Pelosi went there and she caught a little bit of fly support. I thought it was great um, because we need Taiwan as an ally. We talk about, you know, building here in Ohio, right, a uh, state you represent, we have uh, Intel coming to Columbus. We have uh, Google and, and battery production, all this technology. It's becoming the new Silicon Valley. We farm that out to places like Taiwan, and they hold the largest supply of semiconductors in the world. Of course, we've got to keep them as our ally and also give them that blanket of American protection. Uh, absolutely. And, you know, if you look at that picture uh, and you see Nancy Pelosi had already gone, mm-hmm. this was bipartisan. You know, this yeah. was a bipartisan delegation there meeting with the president. So it's pretty unified support there. But you you do bring up an, another issue and, and our supply chain is at risk, obviously, if this were to be a problem. And, you know, while I was there, I did happen to see an interview with one Taiwanese leaders, and they were talking about their semiconductor factory there, and they said, if they invade here, we're going to destroy it, because they are not going to come in here and take this over and use this to, to try and dominate the world economically just one more way. So the things that are going on at home in Ohio, especially, it's extremely important. Our, our supply chain has become so vulnerable. It's happened over about 50 years or so. Scott, if you'd have told me when I was in Iraq that my protective equipment as a surgeon and my pharmaceuticals relied on an adversary, China, I would say, how did we sure. get here? How did our military get here? So we, we've got to reverse this trend. And I encourage businesses across the country to really pay attention to where they get things and who owns the company and and make sure that to bring it to the attention of Congress, because we have got to do things that incentivize more domestic production of the things that feed our our supply chain for our military, for our security at home, and for our health. Well, you know, I think that's the critical issue, right? I don't know if you're aware of this, Brad Wenstrup, because you don't pay attention to these things, but there's an election coming up in about three weeks. And uh, in regard to that, though, we have the issue of the economy, which is first and foremost with most normal people uh, like myself and probably a few of the people listening is that I'm worried about the economy. And now markets are up today, but we have, as you mentioned, supply chain issues. We also have labor shortages and those issues. I think one of the things we can address in a bipartisan way, speaking of that, would be immigration, right? And Republicans are one way, Democrats are another. It seems to me that the, the, the way to alleviate this issue of not having enough workers is to get more people in here who want the jobs, namely those from south of the border. Um, as I understand it, the court process, the FISA court, all those courts, it's backlogged. It's a problem. It's a mess on our southern border. Is there a way to streamline that process to make it easier for people to get in here who want to come and work and be productive and, and eventually become American citizens uh, versus the way we're doing it now without Jeff? Jeopardizing our national security. 
Well, our open border is is a problem. You mentioned national security, and I've been to the border, well, more times than Kamala Harris and Joe Biden combined. But um, I will tell you that you know the concern is is multifaceted. You have people coming from not so friendly places that may seek to do us harm. People that are on the terrorist watch, watch list. Uh, we have obviously the scourge of drugs coming into our country. I have a bill right now. Um, it says it's, uh, stop our scourge, uh, SOS Act, and it's to make fentanyl a weapon of mass destruction so we can put more resources and attention into what is taking place because so many Americans are dying. And you know what? These are our young Americans. These are our future. These are Americans that would serve in our military and on and on and on. So we've got to stop that particular problem. But when you talk about the the economy, yeah, we do want to control the immigration system. We have an immigration system. It may not be perfect, but we have to stick to law and order and change the laws with right. immigration if we're going to be successful. And both sides of the aisle have to sit down and take that very seriously. And I hope that we have a conversation like that as uh, hopefully we take over the House of Representatives and and really try and solve this issue. But, you know, you got 87,000 new IRS agents. The Border Patrol would love to have 87,000 yeah. more agents yeah. so that they could do their job successfully. Wow. And then also, you know, how do we process all these people that are seeking asylum? Bingo. First of all, they should be going to the closest country and seeking asylum and and then uh, get in line like everyone else and how do we expand the court system because the people are just going to go into the shadows right now yeah. and, and, and they're going to continue to do that unless we make it easier and i think I mean, not make it easier because that sounds like well you just want to let people no I, I think you got to streamline it the backlog of cases it's it's unprecedented and egregious because if you're going to wait I don't know, six, eight, nine months, maybe if you're lucky, uh, you're probably just going to come here illegally and say, I'll take my chances. I got to get going. Brad Wenstrup, I appreciate your uh, opportunity to talk to you this morning, and thanks for joining the show. Uh, all the best to you. We'll talk again soon. Okay. Thank you, Scott.